Hi guys, how are you doing? Can you hear me in the back? Right, good to see some familiar faces here. And also good to be back in a Citrix office. I'm actually back in a Citrix office after a really long time. So the last time I was in a Citrix office was uh, spring 1999. So uh, I just finished grad school and I was looking at different startups, interested in working for a startup at that point, you know, like still like, you know, early boom days, back uh, the whole dot com era, right? And so I interviewed companies in uh, Boston and in Florida. And at this point, there was this tiny little startup in Fort Lauderdale, famous for its beaches back then in Florida, Citrix, right? And so they flew me down during spring break to come interview with them. And they let me actually stay over the weekend during spring break and make a report to Orlando and visit Daytona Beach and have a lot of fun. And they were being threatened, you know, it looked like at that point they were just going to get crushed by Microsoft. You know, now in hindsight, it's amazing to see how far this company has grown. That this office is bigger than the company that I visited back then in Fort Lauderdale, which is in a tiny little office, about one fifth of the size of this office space. So, uh, um, amazing how much can happen in a sort of a in a ten year period. Uh, it reminds me of a quote which someone once said, where we often overestimate how much can happen in the next two years, but we underestimate how much can happen in the next ten years. And um, with that context, I'll sort of jump in quickly into the discussion today about Redis. As I understand it, many of you have some acquaintance, some level of exposure to Redis so far. Um, I've been working with Redis for the last couple of years, uh, building backends for a couple of very large scale mobile apps that uh, my company builds. And um, it's been a fantastic journey. I love Redis. Some of you who might have attended my talk at PyCon last year might have heard me harp a little bit about how much I love it. Uh, today's session is fairly basic. It's part of the progression that you guys will go through today, where you already went through an initial beginner level workshop. And I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very simple use case and just show you in like, you know, about an hour's time how, as a little side project, fun little thing, I built a little API, uh, uh, you know, use Node.js to build a simple RESTful API that returns um, a, a quiz question and possible uh, answers and what the correct answer is. So what you can see here. Actually, I think I've ended up cropping out column A. Column A was a question. A, B, C, D are the different uh, possible options. And then this is the answer. And the API that this puts together is just this. Okay. Uh, yeah. What happened here? Let's see. Then. So it's, uh, it's, it's almost slightly contrived, right? But it's a simple example of how Redis can be used in conjunction with other technologies. Now, as you know, I think, you know, if you ask people around, 50 to 60 percent, percent of the people today still use Redis mostly as a memcache replacement, which isn't really using a lot of the power that Redis brings. So I'll introduce you to maybe just something a little beyond that, which is using it as a simple key value pair, but avoiding hitting the database, right? So uh, let's talk a couple of use cases of where something like this might be useful to you. Um, let's say you're building a game, right? You're Zynga. You're trying to build farm bill. Now, one of the important things for you is to not to have to hit your database all the time, right? Now, so when you have a game, a typical flow here would be someone signs in, you load up all his creds, you load up all the game scores, you load up all the details, you stuff them into Redis, and then during the course of gameplay, everything is done in memory. And then at a later point in time, things get written over to disk, right? So this is a fairly common use case. You could apply it to a lot of situations where you could run portions of what you're trying to do real time off of Redis and then later write things to another separate store if, if that makes sense, right? Um, so to sort of just dive into my slightly contrived case here, uh, let's say we're sort of chartered to create a little API that, you know, is going to be consumed by some other app and maybe it's a little quiz app and maybe some of you here are, are big fans of quiz up and some of the other ad addictive quiz apps that are popular today, where you can challenge your friends and, you know, it poses a set of questions with different options. You need to answer, right? And one of the important things with some of these things is your API needs to be super snappy, right? So the performance is, like, super important. So this is running on Heroku servers in the U.S. It's a really lightweight uh, node. It's just on a free dyno, but it's, like, super quick. Um, and I'm going to dig into it and just show you where the data comes from. 
So the data for this comes from this Google spreadsheet. So I just quickly whipped it up and just asked one of the QA guys, a couple of guys on the team, hey, just for fun, just populate it with like 20 different questions, which they did. So it's got about 20, 30 different questions and answers. There's not a lot of data in there, uh, but it's just a simple example. But what I'll walk you through quickly here, uh, it's, it's part rate is a little bit of Node and how to extract some of the data, but it's a simple example of how with Node, you can just stuff a bunch of data on a Google spreadsheet and how you can retrieve it. One of the key, uh, this is the key that you need to use for extracting data from one of the Google spreadsheets using their API. Uh, and then once you've extracted the data, how you can dump it into Redis and then how your REST API can hit Redis to pull the latest uh, item that you want and then to, to send it back. So for that, let me, actually let me, this is readable. You guys can see it in the back. Let me know if you guys can see this. It's okay, the back? Cool. So this is just a very simple contrived Express app, right? It doesn't do a lot. It grabs the uh, Heroku. Uh, Heroku works with Redis to Go. They provide a free instance of Redis to Go, which works pretty great for a little side project, little things that you want to play around with. And I think the plan's great. We've, we've used Redis to Go for a while on some of the other instances that we have. And I think overall they offer a great plan and great support. So in case you're considering them, I would highly recommend Redis to go. Um, so it's just a simple Node.js app. It just comes in here. We, you know, in case there is Redis to go configured in the process environment variables, it grabs it, splits it out to grab the URL, the host name, and the port. If not, it just goes with the local host client that's running. Yeah, thanks. Um, Next from there, my other funny thing is this morning when I tried to run this from a demo, my code's about a year old and it was completely broken, it wasn't working. It turned out that Express has updated a bunch of things, so I had to pin the package JSON this morning <laughs> to a fixed version so that it would work. So this works only with, this code works only with Express 3.0. A bunch of these have been changed in 4.0 onwards. But, um, you know, the bulk of the code in here, which I think is sort of relevant, is one, the code here where I'm fetching data from the Google spreadsheet and I'm pushing it into Redis, right? So like I mentioned here, this is the URL. For, for any Google spreadsheet that you're out there, and some of you might be familiar with this, some of you may not be. Um, so for this Google spreadsheet, this is the URL which gives me a JSON feed. So you can do this with any uh, publicly available Google spreadsheet. Um, just take this URL and change this key up here to be the key that you see up here in the sheet. So you can do this with any spreadsheet. Just open up any Google spreadsheet that you have. As long as it's, uh, as long as it's publicly available. Exactly. So as long as it's public, public this can be. Uh, yeah. yeah, anyone who has a URL also is okay. I think that's, yeah, I think that's fine too. Yeah, anyone with the link I think is okay too. Yeah. So just grab this key, stuff it in here, and it gives you a complete JSON feed. So now all I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the JSON feed, parsing through it. Again, this is this simple coffee script. You can ignore most of the syntax. And then what I'm doing is this is the part where I get the response back. Once I get the response back, I'm essentially parsing through it, creating a hash, and then dumping this entire thing into Redis in this sort of question and answer form, right? So you can see from the feed, I'm essentially taking out the question and the set of responses, and I'm stuffing those into readers so that these can be looked up. Okay. Now, the next piece of this is the lucky API, right? So I'm doing this sort of split into two parts, okay? So the first part is where I'm essentially hitting readers to, um, to fetch uh, a random ha a random key from Redis, and the second part is where I'm actually returning what the current random value is. So I, actually, let me just rephrase that to make it a little clearer. Um, so 
whenever the lucky API is called, I'm not actually trying to generate a random um, item each time. I'm actually pre-populating it on the previous call that has been made. So the first call actually won't return anything. First call will fail because there's nothing that's being stored under lucky, right? So there's a lucky key <coughs> which gets set. And this is set from a random pick from all the different questions that are in the database, right? Now, um, so again, how many of you here are familiar with Node? Okay, a few hands, right? So part of this, not to get, make this too confusing, is there's a bit of async action happening here, um, where this is happening asynchronously, but this is what's actually returning data. So when the slash lucky URL gets hit, the response actually comes only from these two lines of code. So this code executes immediately and returns the response from a from a lucky field which has been populated earlier. But up, while this is completed, this, this code will continue to execute asynchronously in the background to fetch the next random value and to populate that. So that the next time there's a lucky call, that fetch happens instantaneously. Is that clear? Yeah. Uh, no, no, not necessarily. But for this use case, it wasn't too. Uh, the consistency of the result wasn't a factor as much here. It was more about getting a random question. It, it doesn't matter who gets what, right? Yeah. Um, so let's dive into it a little bit. Um, So uh, I did a little side project to also play around with Node, but I'm a lot more comfortable with Python. So you'll just see me dive into Python a little bit here. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go in and clear my reader's uh, database just to show you from scratch. Um, okay. Oh, on the shared. Okay, got it. <laughs> notice. Yeah, I think, oh, still got it. So I'm just going to connect to my local instance and you can see I've got all these keys in here. So let's do a quick It's, yeah. Cool. So I've cleared readers locally, right? And now I'll come in here, and here's a Quizlet folder. So to run this code, I mean, there's a proc file. Uh, so when you push this up, to, if you're using Heroku, you just need to set the Heroku environment variable with the path, which uh, essentially sets a param. Uh, where did that go? Oops. This. Here we go. So in case you're setting this up on Heroku, you need to set up this config value, Google spreadsheet key, and assign that to whatever your spreadsheet that you're trying to pull data from. Um, but if you're running from the command line, it's as simple as just, I, let me go. So once this is running, right, now, um, as I just showed you guys, we don't currently have anything in readers. I'm just going to go ahead now and hit the host. I didn't forget what the default port is. <laughs> so it's initiated the database updates from Google Spreadsheet. As you can see here as well, there's a little bit of async action happening because this responds immediately, right, saying that it's been initiated, and then this processing happens meanwhile in the background. 
and you can see it's finished updating so we'll just come in here and got a bunch of keys in here now come back hit lucky so the first time like I mentioned earlier the first time it hits it's not found because there's nothing in there right but what's also happened is now the other async code is executed it's pulled a random thing and it's stuffed into the lucky key so is it clear why this is not found okay so next time I hit it so it's all just a local a memory hit right so uh, so the concept is fairly simple right if you've got a use case like this where um, maybe the app that you're building whatever you're building right has a ton of data but there's a subset of data where it's useful to keep it in readers in memory and you'd have something very high performant with respect to the reads that you're getting out of it read and writes obviously but um, I think it's a great simple way to apply it uh, or maybe you know you've got a little pet project like this and you know you're working with someone but it's easy enough to get them to use a Google spreadsheet instead of using a database easy enough for them to populate it in there and then you know work with it Google spreadsheet is a great simple API um, and and the code to do all of this right is so simple right it's 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 fairly straightforward to work with readers uh, even without touching a lot of the other very powerful features so one of the things I like about it is to get started to to get a lot of value out of it is so easy. So we use readers internally for a number of things. A lot of our uh, queuing and delayed jobs run on readers. A lot of our pub sub notification patterns run on readers. Um, our sort of instant search uh, uh, runs on readers because a lot of things where you can apply the data structures and problems to. And some of it is just up to your creativity and imagination with respect to what you'd like to do. Yeah. Not oh, re not reliable, is it? I see. Uh, many. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. No. Fair enough. No. We use Postgres plus Redis. <laughs> so. Uh, just to make sure nothing gets lost, we definitely use Postgres. And then, you know, there's, there's a job that hits Postgres to pull, pull uh, data for which jobs need to be run. So it's not done independently for cases where we can't afford to do, lose data. So one of the things that we're actually building out right now is, is um, it's a social media management platform. And that actually helps people. So if people who go out and schedule a bunch of posts, we need to go out at various points in time. And uh, all the posts go into Postgres. But then we sort of have the equivalent of like a cron job which goes and looks at all the posts that are scheduled for a certain time and then those get managed, you know, with readers plus uh, RQ in that case. So, uh, but I, I agree. I mean, you know, there's, see, I mean, readers can persist data as a little bit of a, some people tell me that, you know, readers can't persist, but that's not true. Obviously, it has params for which you can persist information, but it's likely not the option if you're looking at something that's mission critical. Uh, I would still go with the traditional database coupled with it. That's at least my my take on it. I don't know. So Anyone else here wants to chime in? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't taken a chance. So. And anyone else here with experience around this? Any failures with readers that you want to talk about? I mean, I'm sure there'll be more through the days. So, um, so um, how much was covered in the workshop so far? Most of the comments. Comments. Okay. So maybe I'll give you guys a little, just a little. Uh, how much more time do I have, Ken? Ten minutes. Cool. So um, if it's fine, I'd like you guys to just break out into small groups, and uh, just maybe, you know, it's also a nice way to get to know the people around here. So. Uh, just say hello to some of the people around you and just form small groups of four or five. And uh, I'll come up with a few sort of, again, contrived but hypothetical problems, extending this problem a little more, okay? Um, so first, just say hello and just get to know a couple of people around you whom you don't know already. 
Let's sit around you. Come on. <laughs> People you don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, now now's the time for a little confession. How many of you are addicted to quiz up? All right, good. I see some hands. Those guys are being honest. So, <laughs> so this is a pretty addictive uh, trivia game that's there online. And uh, do you want to just tell people how Quiz Up works? Yeah, very addictive, right? Yeah. So let's sort of break that down in a couple of different pieces, and maybe just if guys around here could sort of talk about how you could apply readers and just create separate groups, talk about how you would apply readers to some of those problems. So one part of what he mentioned was the matchmaking part, right? So I, when I come in a quiz up, I can choose any category, and let's just say I pick Bollywood as an example, and it'll find other people around who are also interested in playing Bollywood at the same time and match make them together randomly. So the first problem is this matchmaking problem, okay, matchmaking people. So people pick the categories they're interested in and you match make them to bring them together. That's problem one. Second, once two people have been paired up, right, there's two ways the games happen. One, I'll take the first case first. The games happen live, right. So both people are presented to the same question at the same time, and as they respond, you see if the other guy is getting scores or not. So my actions are being seen by the other person as well live. Okay. So I'm answering it, Kiran's answering it, right? And uh, if I choose the wrong answer, Kiran immediately knows I've already chosen the wrong answer, and his timer is running. Okay. Uh, it, it does. It does after you have also answered. It does. So this is the second piece, which is sort of two people concurrently playing and keeping both their actions visible to each other and in sync with each other at the same time. Uh, the third part of what they do is um, at the end of end of the game, you know what, let's just take these two alone for now. These two problems. The first one is matchmaking. The second one is sort of the live game part and the interaction between the two players as they're going question to question. Uh, if you guys would like to, so I think it's an interesting problem set to apply and how to look at using readers. Uh, just in your little groups there, take, take either the first one, matchmaking, or the live game part, one of the two, and just talk about how you would try to apply readers to solving some of these problems. So, guys, just go ahead. Uh, just, we've just got a few minutes left, so I'll let you just spend some time talking about it, and maybe later in the day we can regroup to discuss it. If you'd like to check out the game, check it out too, it's cool. Thank you. 
Speaker here. Oh, perfect. Good. You're you all set. Cool. I just I'll wrap up quickly and then just wrap. Hey guys, we'll. Uh, uh, I think we're out of time, so we'll sort of talk about this again a little more maybe later in the day to sort of talk about what your different solutions are. Um, I just want to quickly wrap up the code for this in case you'd like to check it out. It's up on GitHub. It's on Argos Quizlet. In case you have any questions, feel free to ping me. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter ID is twit.tat, T-W-I-T or T-A-T. Feel free to ping me if you have any questions or need any help, and I'm also here through the day. So.